are among the 10 most successful pictures ever made. Nobody, not even Walt Disney, was ever quite so completely wired in to what the public wants to see in the cinema. And as a result, his personal wealth is now so vast that people have given up even trying to estimate it. Of course, he hasn't won an Oscar yet, and thereby perhaps hangs a tale. But next Monday night, an accolade of a different kind comes his way when his latest picture, Always, will be shown to the Queen at the Royal Film Performance. <laughs> where Spielberg is to be found at work, Amblin Entertainment, a Mexican-style office complex built for him to his own design by the Music Corporation of America, MCA, in the grounds of Universal Studios. It's a kind of grace and favour residence, home from home for Universal's favourite son. And here he planned always, a love story starring Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter. Stephen, I understand you've been thinking about making Always for, what, nearly 10 years. Why did you take so long? I don't know. I, I guess I just wasn't ready to make uh, a romance uh, or a romantic comedy, whatever you might want to call this film. I wasn't ready to make it 10 years ago. I developed a screenplay and had a great time doing it, but wasn't really ready in my own maturity to commit to, you know, taking a man, taking a woman, talking waxing poetic about each other and talking about, uh, you know, love and, and commitment and responsibility to the commitment and deep things. You know, I was in those days, I was making Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, my commitment was to get the Ark away from the Nazis. <laughs> it was about as deep as I was in 1980. <laughs> but I was also, at the same time, making this movie and, uh, I mean, developing, uh, mm -hmm. always. I would think that the one thread that does run through all your films is that they're, they're about love in one way or another. But this is the first one you've made about love between a man and a woman. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I guess the most famous love story I've done is a, a, a boy and his alien, mm. and then that would be a love story. I, I always consider that a love story, even, oh, yeah. even before the script was written, that was going to be my love story. Um, but yeah, this is the first time I've, I've pitted man against woman <laughs> in a story that ostensibly is about the creation of, of a life and, and depicting how what true love is and how deep people feel toward each other. Yeah, I think in that sense it's a, it's a first for me anyway. Did you have any trepidation about doing this? Well, that's probably why I didn't make it for 10 years, because I had <laughs> a decade's worth of trepidation. Am I emotionally ready for this yet? Is my personal life at a point where I can actually talk to the actors about something that, that, that means something to all of us at the same time? You know, I mean, I mean, I was a kid in a sandbox with a lot of toys for many, many years as a filmmaker. And and as I got older, I began to f have these these urges to not get serious because I don't want to make dark films. You know what I'm saying? But but essentially to not be so embarrassed about putting my feelings yeah. on the screen. Uh, all the films have sort of had personal cores, and that's really what I look for when I look f to make a movie. Um, but they have been, as I've heard people say, high in concept, whatever the heck that means. You know. <laughs> sounds uh, good. But it sounds great, high concept. It sounds like a can't fail with a high concept. I don't know what that means. I thought Empire of the Sun was a high concept. You know, when that film didn't perform, I was a bit surprised. 
not because I was so used to success, but just simply because I thought Empire of the Sun wasn't, you know, a, a journey into misery. It wa was about the death of innocence, but it wasn't really intended to be a journey into misery. What are you doing, Betty? Looks like your size, Jim. I don't want those shoes, Betty. Betty, don't. I don't want them. Basie, I don't want them. Well, somebody will. Basie, leave her! Well, that turned off a lot of people in America. A lot of audiences said, well, this isn't this isn't typecasting for him, so I don't think I'm going to give this film a, a, a chance because it seems like a film that if John Borman's name was on it, let's say, or even, you know, you know, s someone else's, they might give it a chance. But I think, in a way, I have been ty typecast uh, by audiences even, not just by critics, but by audiences even. And in a way, that... that, that it gives me less of a chance to make a sleeper or to break through with something that's very unusual uh, for me to, you know, to, to tackle. But are you still going to try to but do I'm that? I'm still going to try to do that. I'm, I'm not going to cater just to big, expensive, lavish adventure movies or science fiction movies. I'm, I'm interested if I find a good science fiction story, I'll make it. I'm not saying no science fiction ever, no, no more adventure ever. I'm never saying that. But it's whatever, it's, it's my, the thing I did in the 80s I want to do in the 90s, which is when I like something, enough to spend a year and a half of my life on it, I'll make it into a movie, whether it has a high concept or a low concept. Color Purple had a very low concept. I didn't think anybody would see that movie. It made over $100 million in America. And I, I thought that was my art film. I thought, my God, you know, it's an all-black cast. Uh, and, and, and an all-black film has never really been that successful, except a couple of police pictures. And, and so that surprised me. So, so I, I just want to, you know, not have to be... Um, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about, about, about a certain thing, which is essentially that, you know, we are who we are, you know, um, every year. Every year we, we change. I hope we change every year. I hope we don't stay exactly the same. And the movies are simply a reflection of who you happen to be on that particular month when that film's released, or that year that it took to write and create the story in the movie. Um, I like to look back at the 80s and say, well, close, you know, E.T. was who I was in 1982. That's not necessarily who I am in 1990 anymore, mm -hmm. and 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 that's what I really can't predict. I can't go back and say I'm I'm going to repeat myself. I'm going to take who I was when I was virtually a child and m carry that over to the 90s as an adult. I don't think you can do that. I think you just have to go with who you are at, at any given moment in your life. I've only been here all my life, every day. to always in a sense I suppose it's a remake of a guy named Joe and you, you don't actually agree with that but but why did you want to do that well you know to me it's more of an adaptation than an actual you know hands-on remake meaning that uh, I love the story so much there was something philosophically uh, that I had never seen before ever and couldn't think of a better original story to base th this philosophy on that somebody can die and then come back but not as we've seen countless times in movies as a ghost that can be seen by practically everyone and can communicate with practically everyone. But maybe, in a sense, the, 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 the spirit comes back, uh, as may be the case in real life, and haunts you without you ever being able to see or hear the, the, the presence. Um, and the presence becomes a bit of a conscience, a bit of a whisper in your ear, a bit of a, you know, a, a sometimes even a comic communicator. And that really fascinated me. And that whole, for years, when I first saw a guy named Joe when I was a kid, and, 
and then I began making movies, and the, the film itself, the original notion from the Dalton Trumbo story haunted me until finally uh, I said, you know, I just, I would never really remake anything, because I always, well, I was, I used to be outspoken about that kind of thing until I did it, until I did it myself. Hello, Trinda. I'm right here. I'm sitting here, right beside you. I know you can't see me, but I can see you. I can see your hair. It's almost in your... That's my girl. You're still my girl, aren't you? Some scenes in all ways which are um, almost exact reproductions of scenes in a guy named Joe. Uh, for instance, when he gives her um, the present, she says, Oh, girl clothes. Mm -hmm. um, was that deliberate? And oh, absolutely, because you know, if you can't think of a better line and you've got the rights to, to the original film, I, I, my philosophy was do it. I mean, wow, that was a great moment in the original picture. One of the moments that's outstanding in my mind were, were Irene Dunn, who always looked like a girl, uh, turned around and saw the lovely dress and said girl coat clothes and it was a lovely moment I wouldn't that was that was a delicious moment that I wanted to share with the contemporary audience the garbage is sold of all the trouble making backstabbing poison shooting games I ever saw nag 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 hey, girl clothes I don't want it. yes you do no I don't yes you do don't you do no. you really do no. you really don't no okay before I lost my temper. So you do like dresses. It's not the dress. It's the way you see me. What about the casting? Um, Richard Dreyfuss and, and Holly Hunter, why did you choose them? Uh, we were talking about a guy named Joe as early as 1974, and it was one of Richard's favorite movies. And Richard said, if you ever remake that film, if you ever remake that film, I will kill you if you don't cast me to play Spencer Tracy's part. And... Uh, and Richard just wasn't ready. In 1980, I actually approached Robert Redford and Paul Newman to play Pete and Ted at, at, at a point when I was in the early stages of, of, of my wanting to make this film. But then time went on, and Richard began to mature, and he began to lose his hair, and he began to get a little bone structure in his cheeks and his, his chin form, and he looked great in a mustache. And then I saw this movie called Stakeout that uh, Disney made, and that was the first time I really found Richard to be an attractive leading man. He had charisma. He had sexual charisma on the screen. And I said, well, he's grown up enough that I hope he still wants to play Pete. Holly was another story. I, I was just simply knocked out when I saw her in two things. The Miss Firecracker con you know, comp contest off mm -hmm. Broadway. And then I saw her in broadcast news. Mm -hmm. And after broadcast news, I had my cast. That's when I knew that Holly would be a wonderful Dorinda and Richard would be a wonderful Pete. Well, they're very well matched. I mean, very small, but well matched. Yes, yes, the, they are small. I felt very tall in that movie. You know, I felt <laughs> John Huston, sta you know, stature in that film. But it's, I don't think Richard's ever looked taller in his life, either. Well, it's very useful having a very short mm -hmm. leading lady, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't call Holly short. I think, in a way, I'd like to say she's like the tallest actress working in the business today because she just eats the screen area up. She eats the screen up alive. She's so, um, um, I guess, interesting to watch for me that I can just watch her and only watch her. I, I just love her work. But, uh, you know, she and Richard together have, uh, have the same kind of, uh, of frantic energy. And so they're kind of a match made in heaven in that sense. 
I've been reading some of the American reviews of Always. Um, some were very good, but there were one or two that were really quite vicious, almost as if the people wanted you to fail. Did you feel any of that from it? That no. I don't ever read reviews, so I don't get a chance to. I, I have my own little philosophy about that, but you know. Which is? Well, when the movie's over, as we say in America, you know, that's when the fat lady sings. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already been shipped, you know. I mean, if I really wanted to take reviews seriously, I'd show my films to all the critics in rough cut. So at least if they wanted to take me over the coals, but there was one good idea, I could make the change. I'm very generous about that kind of thing. But we don't do that, so, so I, I just don't really bother myself with reviews. I, I read reviews sometimes about a year later, a year after the fact. You see, there's just one or two of them. They just <coughs> sort of seem to be gratuitously spiteful. Um, I mean, are you conscious of the fact there are people out there who think, oh, Spielberg's been successful too long, it's time he failed, let's help him fail? Oh, sure, absolutely. I, but I felt that on, on, on my first couple of films, you know, it, all it took was Jaws. You know, it all it took was Jaws to be this big hit in 1975, and then there were some people who went after Close Encounters of the Third Kind as if I murdered their entire families. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and friends would support me and slap me in the back and say, it's, it's, it's this or it's that, you were too successful at too early an age, but I just think it's the nature of the business. Some people tend to be more creative writing negative, vitriolic sentences as opposed to writing, you know, glowing reports. And, and, uh, and my feeling is everybody has a right to, you know, to their opinion, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it becomes personal when they border on uh, uh, malice or, they, or it borders on defamation of character, you know. Then I would take exception, but until it borders on complete defamation of character, you know, it's just their job. I've got my job, they've got their job. I'm glad I have my job. <laughs> yes, well, you, yes, yeah. it's a nice job you've got there, too. Yeah. But it is a bit hurtful, isn't it, when you, when you get that, you feel that spite coming in? Only if you allow it to hurt you. You know, I found that, you, you know, anything can, you know, if you, it depends on what you, I don't allow much of that in my life. You know, I, I pretty much lead a pretty insulated life in that sense, you know, and it's just, it's, it's almost a, I'm, 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 I'm monastic life, yeah. and, and I've always liked that. You know, I, I have a very important, my private life is very important to me. I don't go to parties, I don't go out drinking, I don't drink at all, I just pretty much stay home. And, uh, and it all falls into the same thing. I'm interested in a general reaction to my films. Yeah. I'm certainly interested in what the audience has to say, because I've always felt that I've always worked for the audience more than anybody else. That's, those are my bosses. You once accused yourself of, of not taking enough chances in the films you directed. Was that because of a, a lack of courage or lack of confidence? And have you, have, have you now got the courage and the confidence to say, the hell with it, I, will, I don't care? Well, I think every, you know, every movie I've tackled, I've, I've said that to myself. <laughs> I, there hasn't been a, a film I've gone into you know, with courage. You know, I've, I've gone into every film thinking, I've never done anything like this before. How am I going to pull this off? How am I going to make this work? Uh, you know, I, I mean, which is in a way very good. It's, 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 I, I get more inspiration from not exactly knowing what I'm doing than I would if everything were completely laid out. It's almost apocryphal. People think I lay every single shot out of every, you know, on the storyboard on every film I've directed. I, I, I have storyboard extensively on my movies, but that's not like making a movie. That's like organizing an action sequence or a special effects sequence where storyboarding is, is, is economically sensible. Um, but I pretty much go on to a sound stage the way that an actor goes on to the floor of the legitimate theater with an audience he's never seen before and he has to perform in front of. Scared. We're all frightened. And from that fear sometimes comes what always is about, which is inspiration. You know, I don't think you get inspiration from courage. You get inspiration from fear. You draw from fear. I do anyway. What did you mean then when you said that you, you hadn't taken enough chances? Well, I just think it, it means that I see a movie like Raging Bull that I know I could never make the way Marty could make a film like Raging Bull. And I said, no, that would be a risk for me. That would be a real risk for me to make a picture like that. I'm not talking about a box office risk. I'm talking about a, a personal challenge and, and, and almost, um, and, and I haven't tried it because I'm not Marty, you know, and I know I couldn't make Raging Bull uh, um, um, one-tenth as powerful or, or, or as, as, as kind of um, quixotic. Marty was able to make it. I know I'm not a hard guy. I know that I have a dark side, but I don't have a real dark side. Well, was it a lack of confidence that stopped you from working with big established stars? Because it's generally thought that the star of a Steven Spielberg film is actually Steven Spielberg. Is that because that's the way you want it? And therefore, if you had De Niro, Pacino, Streep, somebody like that, maybe the star of the Spielberg film wouldn't be Spielberg anymore? Well, you know, I went to Steve McQueen. I went to Dustin Hoffman. 
I went to a lot of big stars when I made Close Encounters. They all turned me down. I went to big stars uh, when I made Jaws. They all turned me down. It's not that I've avoided big stars. I've tried to get big stars in my movies. You know, a lot of stars didn't want to work with a, a shark for nine months in, in the ocean. I don't blame them. I, you know, I, looking back on that, I probably wouldn't have repeated the experience myself. Um, a lot of people didn't want to play second fiddle to a mothership and close encounters. It was, it, you know, I, I, ha I have not, you know, you know, you know um, um, chased after the stars. I don't have a philosophy, that much of a philosophy about the stars. There are certain films like Color Purple that I didn't want stars in. I had a lot of stars that wanted, that called me and wanted to be in Color Purple, but I wanted that film to be anonymous, essentially, just about anonymity of those characters. I didn't want the baggage of, or the memory of all of those successful and memorable roles. But there are films where I went after stars and, and couldn't get them. I almost made Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise and had to ankle that to do Indy 3 because of my promise to George Lucas. Do you regret um, that? Oh, yeah. I regret working with Tom and Dustin. I mean, the main regret is, you know, because we, none of us had any idea the film would be successful. And I worked on the script for almost five months with both Tom and Dustin and the writer Ron Bass. Um, There's a certain irony, isn't there, in the fact that Barry Levinson won the Oscar for Best Director that has so far eluded you. Did, did, mm. you, did that give you a little pang? Yeah. Oh, oh, sure it did, you know, sure it did. I, I, you know, when, everybody, when the film began winning Best Picture and Best Writer and Best Act, I kept thinking, God, you know, maybe I should, should have forgotten my entire friendship with George Lucas and said, George, go hire somebody else to do an E3, and I should have done that. Of course I thought about that. But then it, and I also thought, realistically, I have a very strange relationship with Hollywood, and practically speaking, if my name had been on the Rain Man, shot for shot, what Barry had done, if simply my name had been substituted for his, I probably, in my heart of hearts, don't think I would even have been nominated as, to, as director on that film, and I'm not sure if the film would have won that many awards. Why? What have the they truth. got against Well, it's not that much. I don't really think that much about what anybody has against me. I just, I just pretty much feel that with, uh, you know, um, I mean, I think that I bring to a movie a lot of baggage, the same baggage that I was negatively talking about certain actors bring to their roles. Um, and I think I bring a lot of baggage, and a lot of people can't quite see me making those, those sort of leaps of both faith and, and st style transition to other kinds of films. And I'm not quite, and that, was, that was a real Barry Levinson film. That's, it's like Tin Man, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's like some of Barry's great movies. And, and it, it, Barry was a wonderful casting for that film. Um, um, I was a abstract casting for Rain Man. You know, interesting casting, but abstract. And not quite sure if I would have been recognized or the film would have been recognized the same way it was had I been involved in the picture. Yeah, what one remembers vividly is that The Color Purple gained 11 Oscar nominations, but not one for you as the director. Now, you must have taken that personally, Stephen. It, you, you, well, you cannot well, put a film well, up for Best well, Picture yeah. and not recognize the director, surely. Well, you know, I take it personally when anybody you know, uh, has, a, has a film out that is nominated for Best Picture and automatically is not nominated for Best Director. Hey, Steely! Get here! Steely! This is Suge Avery! Friend of the family! Fix up the spare room! I can't move. I can't move. I need to see her eyes. I feel like once I see her eyes, then my feet can let go of the spot they stuck in. I think that I take that as personally, you know, that how can you know a film be nominated for Best Picture if the director is nominated? I'm not just speaking for myself. I'm talking to all films where that that, that that often occurs. Did that hurt you though? Yeah, particularly. But, you know, you know, I tell you what it did. Yeah, it hurt me initially because I had my feelings hurt. You know that uh, you know that I was kind of out of the club or whatever the whatever I've read. I didn't. That's not. I didn't coin that. Somebody else did, and I thought that was an interesting uh, term or a phrase. But at the same token, the, the day the Oscars were announced and I wasn't nominated, that was the day I was leaving for Hawaii for a two-week holiday. And I flew all the way to Hawa Hawaii with this weighing heavily on me, you know, because I grew up a real kind of a wimpy kid, never, never was allowed into the, into the, onto the football team, onto the baseball team, you know, the big guys never messed with me. They messed with me, but not in an accepting, agreeable fashion, you know, and they just kind of like slapped me around a little bit. You know, and I was never very popular, so it sort of brought back that, adolescence, you know, that acne adolescence 
you know, that I had that I experienced. And I said, God, I feel like I'm in high school again. I feel like I'm being rejected like I was in high school. Then I got to Hawaii, and I was a little bit heavy-hearted, and, and I was with some friends. We went to a restaurant at the hotel. And as we got to the restaurant, um, and nobody had heard in Hawaii what the nominations were. So nobody n knew who I was or whether or not we had been nominated or not. And I got to the restaurant feeling kind of sad, and the waiter came over and passed out menus. And as some waiters will say, they, they announced their names. And this guy said, hello, my name is Oscar, and I'll be serving you tonight. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. <laughs> I said, somebody up there likes me. That's what a, what a nice way to break the, the what, what a nice way to, to put it in its, in its proper perspective. And ever since that moment in Hawaii, I've been kind of, I've sort of enjoyed, you know, uh, this time of year. In your early days, when you first came to Hollywood, you used to hang around with people like Martin Scorsese, George Lucas, Brian De Palma. Do you regret that those days are over? Because uh, I imagine yeah. it must be hard, it'd be impossible to recapture them now. You can't recapture it. You mm -hmm. can never go home again. That's absolutely true. Yeah, I regret, I was just funny, I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, it, it, you, you can't, we had such a wonderful uh, kind of, a, of an incubator in the early 70s late 60s, early 70s. I really began directing in 69 mm -hmm. on television when I was 21, but, and I met all these people around that period of time. I met George Lucas in 1967 when we were both in college. I was in Long Beach State, he was at USC. And I met a lot of the fellows in, in college and then in professional life. And it was not a clique, not a brat pack, nothing that people claim we were. It was just a bunch of filmmakers that weren't afraid to show our rough cuts to each other and we weren't, weren't afraid of that kind of criticism. We weren't afraid of George Lucas or Brian De Palma. I never forget the day Brian De Palma and I saw the rough cut of Star Wars. And it was a, only about six of us in the room. And it was the very first time George had ever showed the picture to anybody and chose six of us to show it to. Well, Brian went off the deep end. What is, makes no sense, nonsense. What's this all about? And, and, and through all of the contention of that wild evening where Brian liked the movie but thought it was a, sort of mixed up. It wasn't really mixed up. It just didn't have 89% of the special effects in them. So who could possibly make heads or tails meet on, a, on, on Star Wars without all those, you know, 500 effect shots. But um, Brian, Brian's contention did lead to George inventing the now very famous forward, like the old serials that crawled up the screen, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Now that came out of that rough cut screening, you know, and that was exciting to see things like that happen. I sat with Scorsese in the editing room, uh, ed helping him edit the last 10 Minutes a Taxi Driver, which is a film totally unlike who I am, and, but he asked me to come in to give my opinion and to make some comments, and I did. That was fun. You know, uh, we've all helped each other with our movies. Uh, I, 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 the, the, the shark blowing up in Jaws was not my idea. It wasn't in the Peter Benchley novel. It wasn't mm. in the Peter Benchley screenplay, or the, in, the, in the Carl Gottlieb screenplay. It was simply uh, some filmmaker friends of mine who read the script and said, the shark's got to blow up at the end. You've got to find some way to explode it, not just kill it, it's got to explode. And without that kind of sort of selfless thinking where the ego is not in, you know, you know, leading you around by your nostrils, but you're open to pain and to embarrassment and to ridicule, and by being open to that with peers that know what it's like to make a movie, who have made movies, so you can respect their word, their critique, so to speak. And, and, um, it's a great way to work. It's a great way to make your movies even better. still do if you were editing a film and Scorsese happened to be in town would you say Marty come and have a look at this uh, less less so now I think it, it's 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 I, I often ask myself why would I be a little less accepting of you know the criticism of of my friends you know um, I, I guess uh, essentially I was very very lost in the early part all of us were kind of lost and just trying out this job called movie directing for the first time and we all needed help now we're all a bit f full of ourselves, and we, we, we all think we know a little bit more than we knew 20 years ago. And, uh, and that kind of self-effacement is not as forthcoming. And also, as we get older, we, get, we tend to all become more crusty and more critical of each other. 
So rather than the, the nice little asides about, you know what could help your movie now? It's, wow, what a piece of crap. You, what, <laughs> you kidding? You're putting that in the movie? That whole four minute sequence is in the movie? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, now we're a little more you know, vociferous about it. So, uh, so it's, it's not as pleasant going down when you, when, you, when, you, when you invite your friends and you see a rough cut. You produced an awful lot in the last 10 years, but I gather now at Amblin you're not going to do as much of that that you've handed over to other people. Why is that? Oh, well, you know, it just it wasn't satisfying for me. It just wasn't fun waking up in the morning going to work. It's like going to school. And the minute I, I always said to myself, the minute this job feels like going to school, I'm not doing it anymore. And producing became a bit academic. And, 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 and I mean, it became a bit like going to, you know, going to a, uh, a large institution and having to study for general education purposes subjects that I had absolutely basically no, no interest in. And, uh, and I also felt that I, I have a very tough time saying no to a director. I have a very, very tough time being very strong with other directors and saying you're wrong and the success or failure of the film depends on this one moment that I really believe that I'm right and you're wrong about. I don't believe in doing that and it puts me in a very compromising position with directors who I love. And so I pretty much said, look, I can't do this anymore. Um, um, I'll hire the director, and that'll be my failing or my success. And if the director is a good choice for that piece of material, it's his job. He goes all the way with it. It's his movie, and I'm out of there. And I pretty much turned over the company to Kathy Kennedy who's and Frank Marshall, who run this company wonderfully. And they make a lot of the choices about what films are made, uh, often without my name attached to it, just under the emblem banner. I said to Kathy when I offered her the company, I said, I want to be able to, to work it. I want to be able to do two movies between 88 and 89. Within a 12-month calendar year, I want to physically direct two movies. And we did. We did, we did uh, Last Crusade and Always. Um, and they both came out in 1989. And that was fun. I had a great time working. I had a wonderful time working. Um, I'm going through a, 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 a you, know, my, uh, you know, my own, taking my time with my own life, my own personal life. I'm taking my time with that. And I'd like to do two films again within, let's say, at least 18 months, uh, because I love being on the floor directing. It's, it's sort of what I decided to do when I was 12 years old. I said, I'm going to be a movie director. I, I never said at 12, I'm going to be a movie producer. I never used the word producer until I was uh, a businessman. You said recently that in the movie industry nowadays, you have to do everything yourself. What did you mean by that? Well, I think when I said that, I, I, I essentially was saying that um, you've got to be good at every job you hire people to perform. Uh, you have to have taste. So when the costume designer brings you five costumes, you make the selection between five choices. And you know what you're talking about. You know, you've got to be able to sit with a film editor. And you've got to be able to know editing as well as a film editor, because filmmaking is editing. Editing is, is as important as directing. And, and the philosophy of directing a sequence isn't just, you know, talking to the actors and blocking the actors with the camera. It's also what does the scene look like? Is it dark? Is it light? Does the light come from the windows? Is it a, a, a upbeat scene? Is it a, a downbeat scene? Is it is it silhouette? I mean, those are those are lighting cameraman decisions that the director must know enough about to collaborate with the lighting cameraman. But do you think the industry is becoming more commercial and less creative? Mm -hmm. Sadly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there any particular reason why that should be? Uh, not enough kids. Not enough kids coming out of college, being trained uh, in film schools, and spending enough time making movies on their own, sort of getting breaks quickly because everybody's looking for the next. I guess me or George. They, they presume that we didn't, we, we didn't hadn't made anything until I made my short Amblin and George made his short THX. In fact, George made dozens of films before THX, and I made dozens of films before Amblin. Um, I mean, I really we all paid our dues between the ages of in my case 12, in George's case like 16, we all paid our dues. I just think there's not enough training. So you don't look over your shoulder and see new Spielbergs and Scorsese's Well, well sure I do. Oh, sure I do. I mean, they are coming up. They're, they're going to make wonderfully successful films. And some of them will make very personal films like Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and others will make films like Die Hard that are just, you know, beautiful machines, watching them crafted, how they're crafted and how they operate as movies. Um, but the sad thing is a lot of the people coming up and getting jobs very quickly, you know, are not well read. They don't know much about film history. They don't know the difference between a Rossellini film and a, you know, and a, and a, and a Antonioni movie, perhaps. 
it's sad, you know, and, and uh, a lot of them have stumbled into the business by the gift of writing. That, that they've written a script and they've demanded to direct what they've written, or they're actors who have been successful, now they demand directing assignments. I don't know. You know, I guess that's fine. Uh, Warren Beatty turned out to be an actor, as did Robert Redford, who happened to be wonderful directors. Yeah. They just happen to be wonderful, but there are others who aren't. You've also said that nowadays, when you look around Hollywood, you see anxiety and a palpable tension around you. Why did you say that? Well, it just, uh, you know, today, because fewer films are made, every film seems to, to count more. It seems to be make or break for someone's career. And the box office success of that movie is either a guarantee of the next job or, or, or you know, lean years ahead. And what's sad about that is that, A, it prevents risk movies coming, coming along, because a risk movie, unless you make it non-union somewhere in the middle of the country, is going to is going to cost your average film today is over seventeen million dollars at the average cost of the budgets it's a risk giving somebody a chance to make a john patrick shanley just took his did his first feature as a director for us and his budget's twenty five million dollars you know and we couldn't get it any lower because of the nature of the material um, that's what's scary that's why there's tension in the air every film has to succeed or uh, corporations fail and it's 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 kind of scary out here because of the budget, because of inflation and what it's costing. But presumably you don't share that tension, you don't feel that anxiety. I mean, you must be I secure. I do feel that anxiety. I'm not secure about that. I, 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 do, I feel responsibility to the budgets that I'm, I'm given. I mean, people don't give me an arbitrary amount of money. They give me what the film costs to make. I try very hard to make the film for under what it takes to make. But Empire of the Sun, I could have made 15 years ago. You know, I could have made Empire of the Sun at the same time I made Jaws for about three and a half million dollars to four million dollars. Empire. Uh, from 1973, when I really began working on Jaws and the budget was first done, to 1987, uh, Empire cost $35 million. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary, you know, price jump. Extraordinary. It's preventing films like a film like Empire of the Sun, at least me directing it, somebody else might have been able to make it cheaper. It's preventing films like that from really getting made today. And they're all going to be dinosaurs someday. Mm. Tell me something about this marvelous building we're in, Amblin, which looks like the Alamo. I believe that MCA built it for you. It was very kind of them, but why did, why would they, why did they do such a nice, kind, generous thing for you? Well, 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 I thought it was very generous, and Lou Osterman made a funny joke. He said, he said, well, don't worry, you know, you know, you know for what the film took in, in what, for what E.T. took in in Bolivia is what this building will cost. <laughs> so so I, I, at that moment, I, I didn't feel guilty about letting them spend the money to build me a home. But I was wonderful. It was just great. And they said, anywhere on the lot, you design your office. And, you know, I don't know whether they thought I was going to build a little house on the prairie, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> a small little three-room shack with, with a secretary actually in my office taking phone calls. I'm not sure they, they expected 30, 37,000 square feet, but, but here we are. You know, they haven't thrown me off the lot yet. And so the guided tour begins, from the office to the courtyard, where the parties are held whenever there's something to celebrate. There's something in that, in that wishing well. Yes, there is, and if you <laughs> yes, throw there is. here, that, <laughs> I wish, might have guessed that it. wish might come true. <laughs> I'm going to try to get my budget in 1974, might as well eat our change today. <laughs> but it's, uh, Still, he paid you back the shot, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah it paid yeah. me back, yeah. I will never go in the water again. <laughs> in this room, deliberately kept cool so that artists shouldn't sweat over their work, the storyboards are drawn up for all Amblin's movies, but of rather greater interest is the fact that it also contains, tucked away in the far corner, the actual spaceship in which E.T. came to Earth. Not a model made to scale, but the very spaceship itself. We did build an area of the ship just with the gantry and two of the legs. We built that leg and that leg and, and the gantry and the, and the ramp and the underside, just about 25% of the underside on a soundstage at the Laird Studios in Culver City where we shot the movie. But but when the ship lands and takes off, this is what was in the movie. And it was huge, that spaceship. It was never yeah. that size, Stephen. Yeah, well. To say that Amblin looks like the Alamo is perhaps not entirely fair. From the outside, maybe. But inside, it's more like an extremely comfortable hacienda, possibly somebody's home. Well, my house isn't like this, but somebody's might be. Well, not mine, actually. And besides, very few homes have a luxurious private cinema like this one, complete naturally with a state-of-the-art projection room. Dining room. Dining room. That's nice. You, you, That's you nice. notice how busy my company is. The dining room is lunchtime, yeah, yeah. and, and nobody is eating in here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, if I had shares in this company, I'd be seriously worried now. Nobody's working. I, I do have shares in the company, and I am seriously <laughs> worried. 
and so to the kitchen where every day lunch is cooked for the company's entire staff and sometimes other things happen too. This is an inexpensive way to make movies, you know. Look, UFO! I, I, I was looking at your kitchen you've got there. I mean, that's bigger than most people's homes, that kitchen. Sure is bigger than my kitchen. I mean, it's the biggest, you know. I don't think I'd move from here if I was. Well, we have to feed 50 people every day. And, and it's a, we have a small operation, you know. Most companies have, you know, thousands. We only have 50. But we still make about three, three to four films a year. But we have to feed them all, or we won't be able to make one film a year. You know, what they, an army travels on its stomach. We're talking about feeding and, and using the word in, in a different sense. Are you. Professionally, are you still hungry? And if so, what would you be hungry for? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm still starving, actually. Um, th there are certain people I want to work with now. My hunger has shifted from a certain kind of story or, or, or um, lo lo locale to a kind of collaboration with an actor. I, I'm hungry, and he knows this. I'm hungry to direct Dustin Hoffman in something, to collaborate with Dustin Hoffman or something. I'm hungry to work with Robert De Niro in a movie. I'm hungry to work with Meryl Streep in a picture. I mean, there are, there are actors now that I've seen evolve Meryl Streep, certainly from, you know, the seduction of Joe Tynan right through, you know, you know Sophie's Choice. And I've just seen these people. Dustin, of course, was an icon before I ever got into the business. But uh, there are other people who weren't, uh, like De Niro, when he was first starting in Brian De Palma's film, Hi Mom, Wedding Party. And I just have a real, you know, yearning to work with people like this. Well, do you think they'd turn you down now, as stars did before? Yes, they would. They would turn me down if they didn't like the part. You know, we're all slaves to the screenplay. When a story or screenplay come out, we respond to that. And then we are intrigued by the elements that are part of that screenplay. But if somebody wants to work with me, I promise you, somebody like Dustin Hoffman looks to the story first, looks to his part, to his character, then to the overall, then he looks to me, and then we work together. It's extremely pragmatic. I think you once described yourself as the perfect example of the American dream, and even if you didn't say that, that's how people might perceive you. Do you ever sit back and think, why did all this happen to me and not somebody else? Um, no. <laughs> I've never, never thought of that, actually, Barry. I never said, you know, why that. That would be interesting, because I have friends in, 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 in my life who immediately would say, why me with all the success? Why did it happen to me? But I've never felt that way, you know. I've always sort of been real thankful for it when it happens. And uh, God, you know, I just want to keep working. Of course reply Something inside Cannot be denied <laughs> You laugh like a donkey. <laughs> Do not. Do too. Uh -huh. I don't do that. <laughs> right, 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 right. Hey, hey, hey. You know that guy? I think my boy, I never saw him before in my life. You didn't just smile at some poor defenseless guy, not you? I guess I huh? did. Yeah, yeah, I think I did. That was a damn fool thing to do, you know. Why, darling? <laughs> are you giving away a lot of smiles now? Is that right? I'm feeling very fine. You are? Are you sure you're not feeling feverish or a little liverish or something? I'm all right, Pete, as long as we keep on dancing. Happy birthday. It's not my birthday. It isn't? No. You mean I forgot your birthday again? No, this time you remembered it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 